Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we're gonna to be unboxing and building the Ender 3 Max. So the Ender 3 Max is, well, it's the Max version of the Ender 3. <laughs> so it's larger, uh, but it shares a lot of the new improvements that Creality has been delivering on some of their newer model printers. And we'll go over those in detail. So we have the power supply with a little bracket covering the bottom. We have the screen, which looks exactly like what we've seen on the Ender printers forever. We have bag of installation tools and bits. Uh, we'll open that as we get through the instruction manual. We have some uh, you know, test filament. We won't use that. Um, I find those super annoying because there's no way to properly mount them on the spool holder, which is what this is for. The other part of the spool holder, which looks a lot like what the Ender 3 version 2 is using now. Power cord, and that's it in this segment. So here's the uprights, but it is attached to the base here with this cable. So I'm gonna have to pull out both pieces at once, I think. So as we can see already, it's a, uh, it's a, it's more assembled than something like the Ender 3. It's not a complete kit printer. So that's gonna make my job a whole lot easier. So I've unpacked the bag of the assembly parts and small bits. Um, we've got the micro SD adapter to USB stick kind of thing. We've got some long M5 bolts. These are going to bolt the uprights to the base. We have our standard Allen keys, screwdrivers, and wrenches. Two more M4 by 25 bolts. Some little retention clips for those Bowden couplers. We've got a nozzle. And then two more stubby uh, M5 by 10 millimeter bolts. We also have a uh, scraper, which is extremely sharp. Um, this thing is like a razor blade. We've got your standards, you know, flush cutters, and we've got the nozzle cleaning tool. Uh, be careful with these. The other day I actually reached into a bag, should have known better, and it wasn't in one of these foam blocks, and it went straight through my finger. <laughs> All right, with that cautionary tale, let's get this thing assembled. So it was difficult to pull out of the box, as you saw, because the uprights are actually connected and tethered by the cord that leads to the hot end. And unlike the you know, typical, say, CR10 type mounting attachment, it doesn't screw through the bottom of the base and into the uprights. The uprights themselves actually sit alongside and get bolted in through the side. So there's these little machined cutouts in the sides and the uprights here will just slide right in like so. The rubber feet on them is catching. That's uh, so just making it difficult here. So there's little rubber feet so that it's sitting on, on those instead of just floating. Okay. And then this is a lot easier to actually assemble than bolting through the bottom where I usually kind of drag it off the back of the table. <clears throat> so these are M5 by 65 millimeter, as I said, really long. And they're just going to screw in through the side like that. One side done. So on the side here with the uh, Z limit switch and the Z motor here, and obviously lead screw, we need to connect the Z limit switch. There you go. They're, you know, like all these connectors, they have these little keys on them, so they only go one way. We'll connect the Z motor as well. And there should be nothing on this side, except this dangling um, rainbow one for the screen. The screen, just like the original Ender 3, bolts into the front here like that. And that's what we're going to use these smaller silver M5 bolts for. Okay. 
And for the screen, that rainbow cable here goes into the connector closest to the bed. Okay. There we go. And now we can connect the power supply. This guy around. Power supply is going to sit slightly different again from the Ender 3. Power supply is going to sit right here like this. It's not uh, overlapping the bottom rail like it would be on the Ender 3. And there are these two holes, one here and one here, that we're going to bolt through. And there's threaded holes on the power supply itself. And for that, we're going to use these M4 by 25 millimeter bolts. Pass them through the holes like that. Grab the Allen key. Here we go. And so now, on the back here, we have this XT60. XT60, yep. We have an XT60 connector, just like we've had on the Ender 3 as well. And there should be another side. Yeah, it's kind of tucked underneath the. Might be hard to see there. There we go. So we've got the other side here. Connect those together. I'm not sure if this should probably go under. Yeah, going under the rail would make more sense. Keep it far away from the bed. So up here, we have the extruder motor. Obviously, we're going to need to connect that. Let's get this zip tie off of here. So we have a couple connectors here. Um, we have one labeled X, that's the X motor. So that's going to be this guy. And along with the X motor, there's going to be an X limit switch. It's tucked inside here. And so the connector itself is inside there. The smaller one labeled X as well. And there's those little notches on it, so it's keyed. It only goes in one way, so just make sure you have it oriented the right way. It's hard enough to get your fingers in there, at least for me anyway. And then this one here is actually labeled in words, filament detector. Um, so we do have a filament runout sensor here, which is nice. Uh, and it's not press fit, it's actually bolted on there. Attach it in the back. And we have E for extruder, that's the extruder motor right here. And we can already see, uh, I'd mentioned those little retention clips for the Bowden tube. They're already pre-installed on, on both sides of the Bowden tube. So those would just be spares, I suppose. Okay. On the front of the bed, we have these swivel clips. So they just swivel out like that. We'll pull off the protective film. And we have the textured glass bed that we've seen for quite a while on the Creality machines and some others. And the back clips don't move, those are stationary. So you just slide the bed under the back clips like that. And then swivel the front clips to hold the front down. As one would expect, we have a uh, Y-axis strain relief uh, on the bed. And somewhat uh, unfortunately, I guess it's a little bit of a miss. You know, we've seen on some of their newer printers that they have um, nice uh, belt tensioning mechanisms that you just twist a dial and it uh, increases the tension. Um, we have to unbolt, kind of pull it out and then bolt it back on. Same with the Y axis. That's kind of back to the, to the original older style um, that we've seen all the way back to the, the CR10 series. We have that newer spool holder. Um, that we've seen on the Ender 3 version 2. Uh, and it just kind of snaps onto the rail like that. Uh, in this case, we'll snap it on the back here. Slide it in the top and just press down. Should, with any luck, there we, there we go, there, perfect. And it's resting on the table right here. And then this is just a, like a quarter twist and it just slides in that. Now, obviously, I've installed it wrong. <laughs> there we go. So in that way, we can put our roll on there, feed it up through the filament runout sensor, through the extruder, and down to the hot end. 
And when we're not using the printer, which of course is never, we're always using them, but if we're not, we can fold this away and it kind of decreases the footprint of the machine for storage, if, if that's your thing. Um, and you could leave, you know, you could leave the, the spool on there as well when it's stored like that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we have a power cord. We'll obviously need to plug that in before we do our test prints. And now we'll go around and, uh, you know, do a, a quick once over. Um, we'll make sure that the, uh, the wheels are sufficiently tight. Uh, so if I'm spinning any wheel by hand, the assembly should move. So there's no slippage there. Um, therefore, that means the carriage is, you know, rigidly secured, not flopping around. Uh, and likewise with the bed, if we kind of twist it, well, there's a lot of movement here. Now, that movement is likely not due to the eccentric nuts being loose on the wheels, uh, but just that it's super loose on the uh, tension on the corners. So if there's no kind of preload tension on those springs, uh, there'll be nothing stopping the bed from just sloshing around like that. So I'll just tighten this quite a bit and already significantly less movement. And then, I would just do the same kind of test with the with the wheels. Get your hand under there, spin them one at a time. Um, that all looks good. They're not slipping. If they are on yeah, middle and outer two. So on one side, the middle uh, wheel has an eccentric nut that we can tighten with the wrench. And on the other side, it's the outer two. On the hot end here, uh, the X carriage, it's just the bottom one as typical that has the eccentric nut that we can adjust the tension. But that all looks fine. Um, they have decided to use a anti-backlash nut on the Z-axis, um, which is you know nice, nice uh, insurance basically um, to make sure that that's a super accurate motion or, or decrease the slop in that motion, if you will, or the potential for slop. And the extruder here is your typical like single drive extruder. Um, they're using a metal lever on here instead of plastic. And as I said before, the filament runout sensor is securely mounted to this plate. It's not press fit like previous versions. And they've included a, like a metal collar in there so that you don't end up wearing a groove in your filament runout sensor. Um, that happened quite often on the Ender 3s on the plastic lever on the extruder um, because the Ender 3 you know, you were supposed to have the spool holder up top and it was coming down, it would actually rub against the top of that hole and create a, a like a groove, a little notch, and then it could get caught in there and that would cause intermittent, uh, uh, almost like intermittent clogging, uh, but it was really just the filament was being restricted in the path as it was being pulled into the extruder. Um, so that's nice kind of peace of mind protection against that happening, having a, looks like brass insert in there. Uh, instead of it being just plastic. And if we check out the hot end while we're just kind of investigating here, um, they've added uh, like a little bit of a, a grommet to the opening here so that there's no sharp edges where the wires and such are coming in. And we have two injection molded uh, fan shrouds directing the air from either side uh, to the nozzle tip. The nozzle is covered in uh, with a silicone boot, so the heater block and the size, sides of the nozzle itself, just leaving the tip exposed, to shield it from the fans cooling it and uh, stabilizing the temperature, keeping the temperature more stable. Also, if you happen to have a failed print, um, most of the materials don't stick very well to silicone, so we'd be able to clean things off, ideally, uh, a little bit easier than if we didn't have that protection there. The power supply here is a Meanwell power supply. This is a 24 volt system, and this is a 350 watt Meanwell. And we want to make sure that we have our voltage selector set to, in this case, 115 for us. Um, as I've said many times, for us in North America, being 110 to 120 volts, uh, it's a non-issue for us if it's set to 230. Worst case scenario, it doesn't turn on. Um, but if the inverse were true, if we were in Europe, when it's 220 coming out of the plug, and we had this set to 115, we would blow at the very least the power supply, um, potentially other things. So make sure that's set correctly. Slide the bed back here. In typical Ender 3 style fashion, we have the control box underneath the unit here. Um, and as they've done for quite a while, the air intake is on the bottom, so we don't have to worry about plastic bits getting sucked in there. And so why don't we take 
a second to flip this over and see what is inside that box. So in the front of the control box here, we do have a micro USB and the micro SD card reader. So after removing the three screws, one, two, and three, there's one more just on the other side of the Y rail, right over here on the top side. So if you slide the heated bed all the way back, you can get good access to that screw. That was awfully tight. And then there we go. So we have the cooling fan for the board. As I said, it's drawing the air in from the bottom instead of the top. And then we have, in this case, a Creality 4.2.2 board. Uh, this is a ARM-based 32-bit board. Um, so we've seen that in a lot of printers for, for the last little while. Under these heat sinks, we would find the drivers, which are Trinamic TMC 2208 stepper drivers. Uh, and so those, you know, provide us nice quiet motion, unlike the A4988s and stuff of that vintage. Um, and so we won't have the memory constraints we would have had on our original Ender 3. Um, and we have 32-bit uh, execution. So that's a faster, much faster board uh, than those Arduino-based boards. And one more thing of note is there is a small fuse at the back. So if you know your machine is not powering up for some reason, maybe you shorted something out, that fuse might blow, obviously protecting the board in the process, um, but uh, just something to check there. And that's kind of your standard mini automotive fuse. And so out of the screws in the bottom, one of them was longer. The longer screw goes in this back hole because it actually has to reach inside this extrusion there, which is recessed about 10 millimeters. We're back and we've got three test prints here that Lee in the shop sliced and printed these for us. Uh, so this is a character from Dragon Ball Z. I'm not even gonna try to guess the character because you guys will probably make fun of me. <laughs> but the print turned out really well. Um, there are, you know, some marring under here. We obviously had some support structures. Um, most of this is just really steep overhangs. So you'll also see a little bit of drooping on the overhangs there under the uh, blades of his hair. Um, but otherwise, you know, the layers are stacking nicely. It's a good print, good, uh, good slice by Lee. Another one is Catwoman. You've seen this before. I'm sure we've used this. Uh, pretty unremarkable, a little bit of drooping under the chin, uh, but that is an extremely steep overhang. And we're doing 0.2 millimeter layer heights. If we were using a lower layer height, we'd have less of a drooping effect because the layers are thinner um, and therefore the slope is a little less. But uh, that turned out great too. And then we have the thing, and this is a two piece print. So the base actually is notched and keyed and it slides in and turns to kind of lock it in. So it's kind of neat. Um, and he under his chin has some drooping as well uh, under the eyebrows here. Uh, but otherwise this turned out great as well. So. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, like many of our other prints on a new printer that we're not familiar with, there's some tuning that can be done to make things even better. But uh, as, as a first three prints, I am more than happy with that. Hopefully you found all that useful. Remember to like and subscribe and ring that bell to get notified when we upload more videos. Thanks for watching.